So, uh, today we are talking about malware. So the real problem is that software doesn't necessarily act in our own best interests. So when you run a piece of software on your computer, um, often you're forced to trust that that program is doing what it says it's doing. Whether you're using um, like Windows, where essentially installing software means that program can do practically anything you can do on the system, um, on like traditionally on a Windows system, or an Android where it asks you whether you're going to let it do a bunch of stuff that the authors asked for permission to do. Um, if you're going to use that piece of software, you have to trust that that program is actually going to be using those permissions, the access that it has, in your best interest. But unfortunately, that's not always the case. So often, um, you know, I guess there's two sides of this. There's malware, which is software that an author has intentionally created to be malicious. So the person who sat down to write the software thought, OK, I'm going to do something on this person's computer that they don't want me to be able to do. Or there's like vulnerable software. So the author of the software is actually trying to do the right thing but makes an innocent mistake, which means that um, that essentially someone can attack your computer because the, the software that you're running is vulnerable. Um, but both of those things are related to the same problem, is that you're trusting the software that's running on your computer to be working in your best interest. But not always the case. So Microsoft even has a, a um, TechNet essay for, that they wrote quite a while ago now that, they, that was released called The Ten Immutable Laws of Security. One of the, the best quote from this essay is, if a bad guy can persuade you to run his program on your computer, it's not your computer anymore. Um, so that's, that's, from, that's from Microsoft. Um, and obviously that was that was written a while ago um, and hopefully things are starting to change where you're starting to be able to run some software without it doing horrendous amounts of damage but um, it's you know that that was the design basically is that a program on your computer can do anything so if that program's running it can basically use whatever permissions you've given that program to do anything that program likes. Um, so it's just up to the attacker to find some way to get that software onto your computer. So usually what malware does is it does two things. It does replication, so it has some way of spreading the infection from um, one thing to another, so one device or one computer to another computer. Um, and once it's there, it'll execute a malicious payload. So what, once it's actually found its way onto a computer, what does it do? Um, and there's a few different ways you can categorize malware. So there are viruses, which is essentially malware that copies itself um, into other executables, so other programs on that computer. So it spreads on that same computer to other places. So it'll spread from, um, it might in infect all of the programs that you've got on that computer with that virus. And then if you took that virus, that program that's been infected and put it on another computer, then it would spread itself to all the um, programs on that computer. Um, but a yeah, virus is um, also used by the media often to just mean any kind of malware. But specifically, it's a kind of malware where it spreads within the computer it's on to other programs or into the boot sector uh, of storage devices. Uh, so the, the old way that computers would infect each other is that you plug a floppy disk into a computer that has a virus. The virus installs itself onto that floppy disk, and then you carry that floppy disk to another computer, and you plug it in, and then you ex you know you boot off that disk, and then that computer gets infected. So it's it's not not aware of the network. It's not doing anything um, to attack other computers over a network or anything, because that's what a worm is. So a worm is a piece of malware that copies itself from one computer to another computer. So it has some way of getting to another computer. Um, some ways that it might do that is just by sending spam emails, for example. It might look at all of the email, um, all of your contact list, send out an email to each person that you've contacted in the past, 
with an attachment. That's a quite simple type of worm. That, and then if you um, managed, you know, if the worm was clever enough at the way that it phrased it, maybe it'll trick you, all of your friends into opening this attachment, which then infect their computers, and then the same thing would happen. Um, or it might be more sophisticated, and it might be via a software vulnerability. So the worm might actually scan the network and look for vulnerable systems on a network and basically exploit those vulnerabilities to take control of the computer based on the fact there was a programming mistake there. Um, and software vulnerabilities and the details of that is something that we're going to go start going into next week. So the history of um, malware. Um, Morris worm was a very important thing. Uh, it was one of the first worms that had a, quite a big impact, so it was from 1988. There was no payload, not intentionally, it just spread via software vulnerabilities and weak passwords onto other Unix systems on the network. But because of the way that it was coded, it actually reinfected the same computers uh, over and over again. Uh, and there was some, limit, some code built into it to try and limit itself from doing that, but it did uh, spread uh, back into the same computers and that caused uh, computers to be basically overwhelmed. So it did cause a major disruption to the internet. Big chunks of the internet stopped working. Um, Blaster worm, a little bit more recent, was another very big incident um, where it spread between mostly Windows XP and Windows 2000 systems, exploited the uh, um, RPC DCOM buffer over overflow, which is a vulnerability that we'll look into in a bit more detail in the, fo in the following weeks. Um, so the way that they figured out how to attack that vulnerability is actually by reverse engineering the patches that Microsoft released to fix the problem. So Microsoft fit, put out a, a Windows update, will fix this um, security problem that's been discovered, and then they looked at what changes have been made you know, what was the update doing, and then from that figure out how to actually attack the system. And then once all these computers that are being infected, um, <clears throat> once they run their payload, they basically tried to do a denial of service attack. So distributed denial of service, so all of these computers started um, trying to overwhelm windowsupdate.com. Um, and it didn't work very well because windowsupdate.com is just an alias for another domain name, so they just switched it over and stopped the attack. But um, but it was did cause a major disruption to in terms of like the number of computers that were infected. So another um, major category of malware are Trojan horses, or a Trojan. Uh, essentially, Trojan horse is a program that looks like it does one thing, but it does something else. So. <laughs> If you send someone that you know uh, a game and say, hey, run this game, and it, it actually does something else to their computer, and that's a Trojan horse. So it's got a covert and an overt action. So the overt thing, the thing that, you, you know, that it does, that the person is aware of, is um, benign, and the, um, the covert thing is malicious. So it's doing something um, with that person's um, resources that then they don't want it to do. And one type of Trojan horse is a remote access Trojan, or a rat, um, which is essentially a Trojan horse that gives someone else the ability to log in to their computer and basically take control of it. Uh, and you know they might have access to all the files on that computer. They might be able to upload files and download files from that computer. They can, you know, a lot, a lot of them you can, you know, move the mouse around and do annoying things like that, which I think you guys have experimented with. Last semester we did a little introductory. Uh, session, which is quite fun, but um, you know, obviously the uh, the realistic things that can go wrong uh, can can be quite severe in terms of like businesses and you know if you get access to confidential information. Um, so how do you get a Trojan horse onto someone else's computer? Often it involves some kind of social engineering. So tricking that person into thinking it's okay to run the program, or that that program is going to do something for them. Um, and that might be in person, or more likely just via digital means like an email or um, a USB left lying around. Um, and there's also man in the middle attacks. So you might actually actually be connecting to a website that you do trust, 
but then someone might be interfering with the network connection and actually substituting out the software that you think you're accessing from a secure place and you're actually downloading it from the attacker. Um, there's all kinds of different ways that you can end up with malware and, um, instead of what you're expecting. Uh, if you download software via torrents and stuff, uh, it's something that you should definitely be concerned about uh, is like how much do you trust the people that put that software on there to actually be the software it says it is. Um, so we actually do obtain quite a lot of software via insecure means. So if you're ever on a website that's not doesn't have any encryption, for example, so if it's just HTTP traffic, then there's very little security in terms of making sure that you are ac actually accessing the website that you think you're accessing. So if you're downloading software from a website where you um, are not sure, not 100% convinced that that pro software is actually as intended by the author and from a secure um, location, then yeah, then it's, you've got reason to be concerned. Uh, so some of the like historically important Trojan horses in Windows were like in the 90s. There was like Netfuss and Back Orifice, um, and a whole slew, a whole bunch of um, Trojan horses came out around that time. Um, and you know, at that at that time, Windows didn't really have. Um, it was it was a simpler time that Windows d often didn't have a firewall at all. So there's nothing stopping someone from connecting into the computer once the Trojan was running. Everyone had a publicly accessible IP address because you know it was before we used um, network address translation for like every router in someone's home. So you could literally just connect in to someone's IP address or scan an ISP for for ports that are open for people that have been infected by a particular Trojan and just connect and start controlling their computer. Um, it's still it's still definitely possible now. It's just slightly more complicated. So those are just slight technical barriers, but uh, definitely it's still a, a just as big of a problem, basically, um, as you'll discover in the lab exercises from this week. Um, so an XE wrapper is basically when you take uh, two programs and bind them together, so that you create one EXE file, you run it. And it actually runs both of the programs that you then that you had uh, put together to create this. So, for example, you could take um, Whack-a-Mole game and combine it with um, Netbus Trojan Horse. Um, so, you know, the server component of that, generate a new executable and send it to someone. And then, when they run that program, the game really does start. So, for all they know, oh, you did send me a game, and it looks like a natural game, but the server's also running and your computer's been infected by Trojan horse. So drive-by downloads is also another problem. So, um, you know, it's often when you're browsing on the internet, um, you know, there are certain pages where you'll, you'll, you'll go there and it will just pop up and prompt you to, like, download an executable file or something. And if you don't understand what that means, you might go, oh, yes, yeah, so this is just part of me accessing this website. And you run the program and... Um, well, you've, you've just lost as soon as you've run that program, as Microsoft have just explained to us. Um, the or watering hole attacks is where you basically um, create or break into a website that someone is likely to, to want to access and put malware there. So, for example, um, there was an attack uh, that was discovered against Apple employees, the software developers, where they, um, this is a few years ago, they had some developer website that they used to access a lot, and that actual website had been um, compromised. So some of the tools that were available there were actually, tro you know, tro trojanized um, software. Um, so, yeah. So rootkit. Um, how many of you guys have heard of the Sony rootkit? Show of hands. So, Jesus, it wasn't that long ago, guys. So, yeah, it's amazing. So, it, it was. Okay, so it was. Well, it must be a decade ago now, actually. Um, so, it's like Beastie Boys era. <laughs> um, so, Sony uh, got into quite a lot of political pressure for basically bundling a rootkit with um, 
the albums that they release. So you know your digital rights, rights management is software that's designed to stop people from copying music and all that sort of stuff. So their solution was, I know, let's infect all of their computers with everyone running you know, Windows, which most people uh, at the time in the 90s. Um, was it the 90s? 2000s. 2000s, I think. So, so they um, basically, if you got like the latest Beastie Boys album or a bunch of albums that came out of Sony at that time, and you put it in your computer and you closed the CD, back then, uh, so it was Windows was automatic default was to run whatever software was in the disk that you put into the computer. For obvious reasons, that's not always the case anymore, but sometimes still is. Um, so you'd put the CD in, it would install the um, the, the rootkit, which is basically the, a rootkit is malware that hides itself from the operating system and from the users. So that if you go looking for it, you can't see it's there. So you know you, in, on Windows you press like Control Shift Escape and it comes up with a list of processes. It won't show the rootkit in there because it's like hiding it. Uh, and if you go and look through the file directory and stuff, you won't see it, the stuff that's there because the rootkit's hiding it. Um, so essentially it was hiding itself so that it could try and stop you from copying music or, or whatever. But also, as a, as a um, consequently, it made it easier for um, other malware or other attackers to basically hide stuff on your computer. Because it was just, it, it did something like, if your file is named a certain way, it just hides it. So other malicious actors basically took advantage of that and started using the Sony rootkit to hide their activities on computers. Uh, so as you can imagine, it didn't go over very well. Um, but then again, if everyone's forgotten about it by now, then I should, I they should be quite happy about that. Uh, <laughs> um, zombies and botnets. So um, a, um, a zombie is basically a computer that's controlled by someone else. So it's a computer that's been infected and now is essentially um, whether you know it or not, is owned by someone else. So they have the ability to make your computer do stuff. Um, and so they'll send uh, or they'll receive commands from remote systems. Um, and a collection of zombies is known as a botnet. So a collection of computers that are all being um, infected and that someone controls. Um, and the traditional way that it worked is you'd have command and control servers. So you'd have a central server that um, all the other um, all the zombies connected to, and then the, the, the botnet um, controller or the master of the botnet or whatever would connect into that central server and then be able to issue commands to the others. Um, nowadays they're getting more sophisticated and they're distributed, so it's more like a peer-to-peer -peer network where they um, the zombies associate with the swarm of other zombies and they can share the information and the commands with each other so that, you know, the the, the person who's in control of the botnet can just connect into any part, any one of those systems and issue a command that then just get filtered through to the rest of the, um, to the zomb zombies on the botnet. Uh, and you also have, you know, they might start using Tor and other ways of becoming more anonymous. Yeah. So is that like the, um, back in the days of anonymous trying to, or just DNS everything, the old units that we call Iron Cannon, which yeah. was essentially um, it gets to an IRC server or a hive, everyone's connected to that, and then someone yeah. sent a command from the hive, yeah. and everybody automatically pointed them to something else. That's like being a willing participant of a oh, botnet. Right. Yeah. So, it's, so yeah, so yeah, it's a good point. So the yeah, so anonymous. So just to repeat, uh, partly because this microphone's not good for ca catching what you're saying. But yeah, so it's a good point about the software that um, the anonymous you used, where people can basically opt in to be have these commands sent to them, and then their computer would then start attacking, um, you know, whichever computer that the, the hive mind of Anonymous decided to attack. Um, yeah. Um, spyware and adware. So um, spyware is basically software that tracks the victim. So for example, a keylogger. So um, if I install a keylogger on, on a computer, and someone else walks up to it and starts typing stuff in. So, for example, they log into um, their bank account or, um, you know, PayPal or my Beckett or whatever. Then um, that all of the things that they typed in is logged to a file, and I go back up to that computer and I grab that, that, and then I've got access to everything that got typed on that computer. So it's quite a serious, like from a privacy point of view, can be quite um, 
quite a serious problem. So the sorts of information that can be collected is obviously passwords, but also credit card numbers. Um, and um, if, if you collect enough information, obviously, it you may be identity theft. So if you manage to, you know, get access to someone's email account, um, that often gives you access to basically everything else because click forgot my password on whatever website it is. Um, yeah, serious problem. And, and adware is malware that displays unwanted advertising. So, and where you draw the line between um, adware and just annoying ad-based revenue-driven programs um, is, I guess, a kind of a bit of a blurry line. So, basically, adware, often it's software where you're, you install, I don't know, I think LimeWire is an example back in the day where it was like a peer-to-peer -peer network. Yeah, so you down you download that one of those programs, and you know you it will actually ask tell you as part of the license agreement that you're agreeing to it. So it's like you can't turn around and sue them, but essentially you're giving them permission to install software that um, pops up advertising on your computer. And one way it might do it would be just to pop something up into the middle of your screen, click this, and and you you know you get all the big pop ups and everything popping up. But it might be a little bit more subtle than that. It might actually just subtly change the websites that you're already accessing to just include an extra advert or to swap out a Google advert for their advert because obviously that you know they make money each time someone clicks on it um, and um, the the current thing that's in the news this week is the new version of Windows so the Windows 10 technical preview includes a keylogger apparently um, and you're agreeing to that when you inst put Windows 10 on your computer, you're saying, yes, I agree that everything that I type and everything I access will be sent to Microsoft. Um, it's nice the NSA being more transparent. <laughs> um, you'd be surprised. It's not always the NSA because the companies have quite a lot of incentive to spy on you as well because if a company knows more about you, they're more likely to successfully advertise to you and they're more likely to give you an advert that you're likely to click on. Um, so it's not necessarily because they want to um, know everything about your personal life, but it's because they want to make sure they can target advertising. And as a consequence, the NSA can conveniently access all that information if they ask Microsoft, allegedly. Um, <laughs> What's the difference sort of, between Adware and sort of the, the websites that, that remember or look through your search history and then yeah. advertise products in your search history on yeah. YouTube? Yeah. So, um, so yeah. Like I said, it's a bit of a blurry line. But when cookies were first introduced, it was kind of controversial, and people would turn off cookies in their web browsers because it allows websites to track you. So, if you're, um, if you don't know, a cookie is essentially when you access a website, it'll generate like a string or random string that identifies you, so that next time you visit that website, it sends the cookie through with that random thing or with your username or whatever. So then they can see it's you each time. Um, so, so they can tell when you go back to the website. But if you disable cookies, most of websites nowadays will stop working properly because they rely on that to work properly. Um, but then you have third party cookies, which is the biggest secure, uh, privacy concern, which is where it's not just the website that you're logging into. So you log into um, YouTube or whatever, and they, you, you send them a cookie. But you might also have embedded in that website uh, some advertising um, domains, and you send them your cookie. So then they can start tracking you across all the different websites that you visit. So they can see that you've accessed this website. So for example, Facebook, the like button. Yeah. So Facebook know whenever you're at all, everything. So if you're logged into Facebook, they know every website that you've visited that includes like a Facebook like button because it sends a cookie back to, to them each time you access those things. But yeah. Does it matter? Does, does, it, does it actually matter that someone yeah. tracking what you're doing? I mean, does, does it matter? Does, does, does it actually matter that <laughs> someone that I'm never going to meet is reading my email? Well, I'll do a whole lecture on privacy in, in later toward, towards the end of the semester. <laughs> but just, but just, a, just a show of hands, a show of hands. Do, does it matter? Do you care? Do you mind? If someone tracks everything that you do on your computer and on the internet, 
A show of hands if you do mind. Up. 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 Yeah, and so that, that's the majority of people. Um, and um, we'll talk about that in a few weeks. And it's because it, you know, maybe you don't. I'll just I'll say I'll say one one thing one thing about that is there is an argument that if you've got nothing to hide, then don't you've got nothing to be worried about. But think of the the way that things can be used out of context. Think of the way that people can be manipulated and taken advantage of if you know a lot about them. That's all I'll say, but we'll talk more about that in a few weeks' time. Um, so, scareware and rogue antivirus is quite a common type of uh, malware, where essentially um, they try and scare the victim into installing something. So you might actually be on a website, and it pops up and says, detected your computer's infected, click here to fix it. You, um, and if you're not that bright, you might think, oh, the website knows about my problems and can fix it for me. You click the button and you install the software and then now you've actually got malware on your computer, which might actually look like antivirus software itself and it'll come up and say, uh, scanning, digga, 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 digga. oh, one billion you know, <laughs> pieces of malware on there. Fix, click fix, and then da, 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 da. Oh, I can fix half of them for you for free. But if you want the other half fixed, then pay us money. And then people actually get fooled into paying them for infecting your computer. So not only have they got malware on your computer, but they've tricked you into paying them for creating the malware that you've installed on your computer. Could it use other malware to, to find out what antivirus software you use? And then when it produces something that looks a lot like antivirus, it could look identical to a virus or whatever. Yeah, know. well, actually, I haven't heard of that happening, but I guess there's no reason that it couldn't try and disguise itself as the antivirus that you've already got on your software, on your computer. You could be a, a good evil genius. But uh, no, it's, no, it's a good point. It's a good point. Um, often, they, it will disable other antivirus software. So a lot of viruses try to turn off any virus scanners. So the first thing it does is will actually disable whatever antivirus you've got. And depending on whether that antivirus software has some kind of protection against that, um, often it, you know, the, the, the malware will just turn off your anti-malware. Yeah, good fun. Um, ransomware. Uh, this is like quite current and happening at the moment is quite popular. Um, so I'll talk, just in a minute I'll ask you whether or not you know anyone that this has happened to recently. So basically what ransomware does is it tries to um, extort money from the user, from their victims. So the, there's a few ways um, that it does this. Often by just locking the computer. So it'll, set up, it'll install stuff on your computer so that when you turn it on, it just you can't access anything. And you have to basically pay them to like get rid of the malware so that it works again. Um, but also it might claim to have detected that you've done something illegal. So it'll say, oh, I've detected that you've been accessing this, this, and this, and therefore um, if you don't pay up, the police will be after you, essentially. And um, wasn't there a story recently where someone actually committed suicide after receiving one of these threats? Um, so, yeah, it's, it, ha it can have pretty serious consequences. But the probably the most likely one that you would have heard of is CryptoLocker. So that's just recently, last year, um, where it encrypts all the files on your computer so that it's it's basically impossible to get the, the original um, files back unless you um, pay up. And the payment um, in most cases was via Bitcoin. Uh, and looking at Bitcoin transactions, we can see that something like $27 million was actually paid by people that, um, that, that got infected. Um, and um, there were, essentially it was impossible to, to decrypt because the, the actual, um, the encryption was done with a private key, which was never on the computer to start with. The public key of the, atta of the attacker is used to encrypt all of your files. And then the only way that you could decrypt it is if you manage to get access to that private key. And obviously, the attacker is anyone that has that. So if you want it, you have to pay up. Um, and the, the official advice is obviously don't pay up because you're paying. Basically, it gives, gives them more incentive to try harder to do this more to other people. But when it's your files that are, that are being held ransom, then I guess you know, your decision-making process might also involve you know, what it is that you've just lost. 
Did they actually unlock it, or did they just leave it locked? They did. They did unlock it if you paid up. So, <laughs> yeah, at least they're honest, honest criminals. Um, yeah. Um, well, I guess. It, I guess if, if people knew that they weren't paying, they weren't giving them access to their files, then people would actually um, not be less likely to pay. But also, um, if you use antivirus software to get rid of the crypt, um, crypto locker from your computer, then you, had, you also had no way of getting files back unless you reinfected your own computer so that you could decrypt the stuff. So, yeah, there was a... Um, a very big takedown of a botnet, which is the Game Over Zeus botnet. When that was taken down, they did recover private keys for from a bunch of people that had been infected. So it is, if you are lucky enough to be one of those people um, whose private keys was part of that, then um, it might be possible to decrypt your files now. Uh, and I believe there were some versions of this software that had a like a program mistake, which also allowed you to recover your files. But in most cases. If done r correctly, it's just impossible to get your files back without their without the attacker's help. Um, on that note, banking trojans. Actually, no, sorry. So, who here knows someone who has actually been hit by a crypto locker? Do you know? Does anyone here know someone who's actually been affected by a crypto locker? Yeah. And show of hands. Okay, a few, a few. Um, did they pay up? Did they pay up? No? No? No. Uh, um, so, so they, in that case. So, banking Trojans um, are Trojan horses that focus on stealing banking information. So, Zeus is probably one of the most um, famous, or most popular recently, uh, and it can perform man in the browser attacks. So, essentially, what a man in the browser attack is where your actual computer is infected to the point where it changes what your browser is doing. So when you log into your bank account, you, um, you log into your web browser, and you um, basically tell your browser, transfer some money to this person. The browser then talks to the web server in an encrypted, you know, using SSL encryption and everything like that. So it shouldn't be possible to do a, a man-in-the-middle attack but if you can change what the web browser is saying, you can still get into that transaction and change the <laughs> message that's been sent to the bank. So you could say to the bank, actually make that $2,000 you're sending and actually make it to this person. Um, and if you have like an authentication token, then um, you know, if they're controlling what's coming out of the, um, depending on what you need to type into that, you, they might trick you into typing what you need to into that authentication token. Um, and I mean, I wrote a man in the browser um, attack that did just that. Obviously, I never released it, um, but so it's not that difficult. It's you just you could just write it as a Firefox extension. Um, so, um, just an example of um, how some of these like things can work is you can have a um, Basically, you've got the person who writes the, the malware. They sell a copy of that malware onto someone on the black market. A malware exploiter purchases the malware, and they, they basically use it to, to steal banking uh, credentials and information. And then they can then access those compromised machines to transfer um, the funds to somewhere else. Um, and then basically, they would send it to a money mule network, so a bunch of people that work together to um, basically transfer that stolen money and work as a middleman, um, and they get paid a percentage for being like in the um, crossfire, basically. Um, but it gives the um, the malware exploiter a buffer between the police and them, and the victims are just people that um, you know, individuals and businesses, financial institutions. So it kind of look, works a bit like this. So the, um, I think I essentially just described it. So, um, yeah, and it's everywhere. And obviously, this picture comes from the FBI, so it's all about the fact that they're American victims. Um, but the actual people who wrote the code and the people that are transferring the money are not necessarily within the same country. So, 
as soon as you have multiple jurisdictions involved, it also becomes very hard to actually um, go after people legally um, because if you um, if you have people across um, jurisdictions, the the legality becomes difficult to follow through with. Uh, it's not impossible, depending on the the level of um, you know what has what's happened. So sources of software. Where do you get your software from, guys? Like, how do you know? How do you make a decision about what you should install on your computer? Um, maybe just uh, could someone just suggest where they get software from? <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. So if you're torrenting software, uh, how do you know that you can? How do you know that you can trust the software? Peer review. Peer review. Um, and what, reading the comments from other people that have used the software? Um, and do you think that they, someone would know if they had a keylogger installed on their computer? You'd hope with certain things that they would do, but obviously... Um, how many comments are, you, are we relying on? And how educated are these people making these? This feedback. Could be the attack of yeah. There you go. There's thinking. So um, yeah, probably not the most reliable source. I'll talk about ways you can protect yourself against software that you might not trust in a minute. So it's not that you can't run this software, but I definitely wouldn't just install it on your main Windows system because you'll be doomed. Uh, probably, <laughs> maybe, possibly. Um, <laughs> Any other ideas where you might get website uh, software from that you may or may not trust? Company's website. Company's website. So, for example, if you wanted a copy of uh, antivirus downloading it from, you want to AVG, just download it from AVG's website. Right. So, you how do you get to AVG's website? Either type in the URL or just go do. Can you give me an example of a URL that you might type in? www.avg.com um, may or may not be their website, but also if you didn't type HTTPS at the beginning of that website, you're not using encryption, you're not using any verification that the website you're connecting to is actually their website. So you could be a victim of man in the middle attack and actually connecting to someone else's computer, the attacker's computer, for example. How else you might, might you go? <laughs> basically, basically, you're doomed, is what I'm trying to say. Um, so, um, so yeah, you can you can do these things. There are ways. Um, it's all a matter of it's a scale of um, likelihood, right? If you go to their website, then probably and you, and it's not in, and there's no like certificate there. You're not using a secure connection. That's more secure than getting it from a torrent. Um, but there's still there's still some risk there. So um, one of the ways that you can kind of be sure that they are who they claim they are is to look at digital signatures. So a digital signature can prove the author of the software. So on Windows, when you run something, it'll say, do you trust Microsoft Corporation um, you know, to run their software or, or whatever? And in that case, you know, if you are confident um, that you trust Microsoft, I mean, you already do if you're running Windows. So then you, you know, might agree to run that software. But if it says, do you trust unknown author to you know have the software? Then you might reconsider. Where did I get this software from? How much do I trust it? Um, so, what can you do to protect yourself? Um, so, you can use access controls. Um, so, access control is basically the the technology built into an operating system to decide which programs can access what, or what people can do what on what computer. Um, and normal users have um, <coughs> less privileges. Um, back in the day, Unix uh, had normal users and super users. For a long time, Windows only had administrators. So if you used anything before Windows XP, then everyone, when you logged in, was just running with full access to everything on the computer. Windows XP had si system administrator accounts and normal administrator accounts, but you basically nothing works if you don't if you're not an administrator because all the software wasn't designed for that feature. But it was a step forward in terms of security. But if you're using Windows XP, you kind of have to log in as administrator if you want stuff to work. But then from then on, 
stuff has in, it has improved where you can be um, logged into a computer and not necessarily every piece of software you run will be able to do anything on your computer. So the moral of the story is don't log in as administrator on your home computers unless you really need to because as soon as you do that then if you accidentally run a piece of software that you don't trust then a lot worse stuff can happen than if, than if you just logged in as yourself. Um, and if you, sometimes you can actually install software without being an administrator, and that's probably the safest way you could do it. You could just create a new user account, install some software onto that without, you know, without actually um, elevating to administrator. Um, but then obviously that there's still a lot you can do if you if a piece of malware just runs as a normal user. It still has access to a bunch of stuff, right? So it's still got access to all of your web history. It still has access to all of your personal documents. It still has the ability to, to attack you, know, you using your banking website. But what it can't do is actually change your operating system. Um, but we really do need to protect root at all costs, the administrator access. So how can you do that? So the traditional way of protecting yourself is just don't run stuff that you don't trust. So trust-based selective execution. So I'm only going to run certain programs. Uh, and how do you decide that? Well, you might have a blacklist of programs that you don't trust. For example, you have anti-malware that has a list of programs that it doesn't think you should run. So it, it'll stop you before you even start to run it. Or an even more secure way, but practically impossible, is to include have a whitelist. So I'll say I'm only going to trust these programs or or programs from these places. And if you have a really locked down corporate network, it might be worth doing that. Um, although a few years ago, one of the companies that provides that service got hacked. <laughs> so, um, but, but you can actually um, you know, use a whitelist within your company and say, OK, I'm only going to run Adobe software and Microsoft software, for example. And that would make your computer very secure, but very hard to use if you wanted to do anything else. Um, Signature-based um, detection uh, is basically when you base those blacklists or whitelists off um, looking at the contents of a file uh, and trying to detect whether it looks like something that's been seen before. Yeah. With the blacklisting, is that kind of what zone alarm does? Zone alarm sort of firewall? Yeah, I mean it kind of has the ability for you to uh, give permission for some Right. So that's that's like after you've already trusted the program to run, what it's allowed to do um, in terms of network traffic. Uh, I guess what I'm talking about now is how do you decide which programs you allow to run in the first place. So um, like a lot of antivirus software will be based on a, a signature. It might, I mean, a lot of firewalls and IDSs and things are signature based as well. But in terms of deciding which programs to run, we look at the contents of the of the program and see, oh, this looks like a virus I've seen before, and it might be slightly different, but enough similar enough that it, it matches the signature. Um, but the simplest kind of um, signature might just be like a one-way hash function, like MD5 or SHA SHA1 or whatever. Um, but then, as you just change it slightly, then it wouldn't match that anymore. So you've got kind of fuzzy hashing where you can detect programs that are similar. Um, Anomaly-based detection. Um, is where you detect the software is doing something it probably shouldn't or that it's never done before. So you might look at the way that the, the program's talking to the operating system or you might look at the files it's accessing. Um, but the problem with using anomaly-based detection is that it's prone to false positives. So um, if you have a perfectly fine piece of software but you start using it differently, it might trigger an alarm. Whoa, this program's never been used to access that resource before. And it's like, well, I've just never used it this way before, but it's just I'm still using it. Or a false negative where it it actually actively tries to make it look like it's doing something similar, but it's doing <laughs> something bad. So it can often fool those kinds of detection. So I said before, digital signatures uh, can be used for whitelisting. Um, and you can basically identify and authenticate the author of the person who's distributed the software. So for example, you can use Microsoft App Locker or Microsoft Software Restriction Policies, or Apple App Store, or um, Linux Software Repositories are all based on that, where you can basically have signatures attached to certain um, executables, and you can say which of these you trust and which ones you don't. Um, ActiveX controls, because um, 
was a horrible idea, but basically uh, one of the first ways that websites pro provided like cool features was to use ActiveX. But as soon as you browse to the website, it pops up and says, do you trust this person? And you click yes, and then they're running a program on your computer. Uh, a very bad, uh, in hindsight, a bad idea, but at the time I'm sure it made sense to someone. Um, Reputation-based security is basically where you look at information collected from lots of people, and like if this virus has been seen, like, or if this piece of software is used by thousands and thousands of people, and no one's complained about it, then it's, we will trust it, kind of thing. Um, so, for example, um, like the new Norton and McAfee and things like that, they often use these cloud-based, uh, you know, things where you, everyone sends information about everything they're accessing to them, and then they can use that to decide whether it looks suspicious or not. Uh, but it kind of it also depends on how many people are using the software, and there might be niche pieces of software which are perfectly fine but not used by many people. And obviously, new software, um, you know, it's not going to work. So bad news is all of the approaches fail. Like everything that we have to protect, protect ourselves against malware, they often fail. Um, so digital signatures and certificates have failed loads of times. So once VeriSign actually sold a Microsoft code, code signing certificate to someone on the internet. So they said, oh, I'm Microsoft, can I have a, a, a um, certificate please? So there's someone out on the internet that had the ability to just sign stuff so it looked like it came from Microsoft. Uh, that's a major problem, the whole idea of being able to use certificates to trust people. It only works if the people that are verifying who gets the access to those certificates are actually doing their job. Um, but also blacklisting techniques just fail to detect almost like everything that's new. So as soon as you if, you, if I go back to my office and write a new piece of malware and send it to you, it's very unlikely your antivirus <coughs> software is going to detect that it's, that it's a problem because it's never seen it before. So, you know, obviously it doesn't protect very well against targeted attacks. And Stuxnet, obviously, is a big one, discovered in 2010, um, basically spreads between Windows um, computers and infects USB drive contents, um, installs as a rootkit, uh, then goes on to attack specific SCADA configurations, so, and that's the software that uses uh, controls industrial machinery. So it's an incredibly uh, sophisticated piece of malware, um, and many believe, pretty much everyone agrees now, that it was actually targeted at um, Iran's nuclear facilities um, and allegedly created by um, Israel and the US government. So, cyberware, cyber warfare, maybe. Um, sandboxing. So one um, thing that you can do to, to protect yourself is to use a sandbox. So if you've got your torrented software, which I'm sure is perfectly legitimate, um, and you want to run it and be sure that um, you're safe to do so, then you can use a sandbox to actually confine that program so that when you run it, it can't go off and damage your computer. So you can, um, and there's a few different ways of doing sandboxing, um, but it doesn't solve the, the problem completely. So for example, we've still got malware on Android and it uses a sandbox. Um, but you know, there are a few different things you can use to protect yourself. If you're using Windows, I do actually recommend Sandboxy as quite a nice way of just running a program. And it can't write to the registry or to files. It just has its own kind of space that it sits in. So in conclusion, um, so malware and software vulnerabilities are very common uh, security threats. In both cases, it allows an attacker to run malicious code in the context of a process running as the end user, or in worst case, as, as the kernel. Um, and it's essentially an identity problem because we're forced to trust that a, the program is acting on our behalf when it isn't necessarily. So um, that's what this week, that's the end of the lecture. And this week's lab is starting to look at uh, Metasploit. And you'll actually generate your own uh, Trojan Horse software to um, have a look at. So thanks, guys. And I'll see you um, next week. Thank <laughs> you.